Hello and welcome along to the Property Academy podcast. I'm your host, Ed McKnight. And I'm Andrew Mickle. And today on the show, we are once again joined by Tony Mounts from Tony Mounts Mortgages and Insurance. And we are talking about how to buy property if you're a Kiwi living overseas. How do you buy property over here in New Zealand? Now, we know this is a very popular topic at the moment with more Kiwis wanting to invest their money in New Zealand so that if they decide to come home, they've got a property or they just want exposure to the market. So, Tony... What should somebody know if they're a Kiwi living overseas wanting to invest in property? How do they get the money for it? Thanks, Ed. Thanks for the opportunity. They need to know it's difficult and they need me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, they need help. It is difficult. There are rules and more rules wrapped around it than there are for people buying locally. It's just a fact of life. It's very timely. It was on the news last night. So people would have seen it. These people buying from overseas, sight unseen, just with the video walkthrough and then the builder's report, etc. Um, you know, perhaps a bit of panic. They're buying, getting ready to come back home. They're getting um, back home and they can move straight into their property. We've got a lady coming back from Australia. As soon as she moves out of her quarantine space or whatever it is. Her facility? Facility, she goes straight into the house. And this is not unique. And so if you're overseas at the moment, firstly, who can buy in New Zealand? Who can buy in New Zealand? New Zealanders living overseas, Australian citizens and Singaporean citizens can buy in New Zealand. And there are then the exception of new build apartments, which of course you guys luckily deal in a lot. (laughs) And they're an exemption under the, what's it called? Overseas Overseas Investment Act. Act. So they are the four food groups, are they? Yeah, they'll Mm. do. They are the four food groups that can buy from overseas. And now if I'm an overseas Kiwi and I'm going to return to New Zealand because it's a safe haven uh, and I want to buy, then how's the bank going to look at me as far as income? So I'm going to leave my job and move back to New Zealand. What's going to happen there? Well, the first thing is not to do that. You don't leave your job until you've secured your property. And you don't have to be underhanded. You are just telling the bank the truth. You're buying a property temporarily as an investment. Once you've got a job in New Zealand and relocate, that's okay. Yeah, You're allowed to do that. So you can have a change in yeah. circumstances yeah. afterwards. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. And because you rent it out in the meantime for the 500 a week or whatever, you buy it. Now, the banks are going to be more stringent, though, and they are. They're going to cut down the, uh, sorry, increase the deposit, not cut down the yeah. deposit. That'll go up to 30%, which used to be, of course, the um, you know LVR rule anyway. Used to be the norm. Uh, on the 1st of May, LVRs got taken away, but the banks didn't take away the 30% deposit for an overseas investment. Having said that, a second-tier lender, which is not really second-tier because the interest rates are so close to normal, called Resimac, will, in some instances, go as high as 80%. Uh, for the overseas investor buying in New Zealand, but typically they'd need to be in, you know, in Australia. It's an Australian thing, really. And now, Tony, I also heard as well that BNZ, for, for Kiwis living in Australia, will currently go up to 80%. Yes, is that true? That is true. So that's only a very recent change, and the, also they have the lowest, I think it's the lowest, what's the word, sensitivity on the exchange rate, in other words, 10%, whereas some lenders are as high of is six as forty percent. So what does that mean? You're on a hundred thousand dollars sitting in Australia doing a good job. Suddenly the bank is saying, no, it's only sixty thousand. We need to sensitize that income. Now look, they do have to to a bit because of course there's exchange risk. We all get that, but ten percent on an exchange rate between New Zealand and Australia. It's pretty fair. So they convert it to New Zealand dollars and then apply a sensitivity rate. Correct. Yep. And just which just cuts down your income. Yes. So therefore cuts down the amount you can borrow and of course makes it harder to borrow. So luckily the Resumex of this world are now only three point three nine. Not terrible, not terrible, not that much higher than the bank rate of two point five five or two point four nine that we're are seeing at the moment. So there are options for lower deposit. Yes. But obviously if you've got a higher deposit, well, that's great. And it gets it done. And so tell me, uh, this, going, coming back to the 30% deposit that I need, can I use an overseas property as part of the mix and borrow 100%? Yes and no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look, it is difficult. So we've got a doctor who's come back. Their house is in Scotland. Scotland will not, even though it's nearly unencumbered with a million dollars, sorry, £500,000 or whatever it is, they won't do the top up for the 20% so that that person, just because it's going, the money is being repatriated 
offshore. Yes. And yes, you'd say, well, that's silly. They've still got a job. They've got the equity. They've got a million dollars of equity. Why can't they take a $200,000 cash out that it's called and make it a deposit? So, look, it's not easy. Uh, it's not impossible. An Australian could do that. But BNZ will not, for example, they're a good example because we've been talking about BNZ and some of their policies. They won't allow that to happen, but some other banks will. So everybody's different. We just have to know what the rules are on the particular day that suit the particular person. And are you seeing banks be uh, more favourable depending on where you live as to other places? So, for example, if you were working in Melbourne at the moment and you were still in a lockdown, are they being more challenging than someone that's living in maybe Sydney? Uh, yes, they are. And... Probably rightly so. It's hard to argue Absolutely. against that. Yeah. Okay, and we do have a Melbourne person trying to buy a property today. Right. And yes, yeah, not, not that It's easy. tricky. It is tricky. It is tricky. Um, look, and look, that's just logical. It's obviously easier to buy when you're sitting in Australia, Singapore, Canada, US, than, look, I better not name some obscure... Uh, Bahrain Thank you <laughs> That'll do So obviously it's easier to do it from England And what we would call our sister countries if you like um, Auss Aussie's the obvious one But if you're sitting somewhere a little bit more obscure Not easy at all So look, it's a difficult game It really is And as always, get good professional advice from someone like myself <laughs> And for instance, you're, you're an investor in Scotland. What happened there? Was, were they just unable to, to oh, purchase well, an investment because they weren't able to get the money out? Or how no, did that work? subject to sale now. They have put the property on the market. They have no choice. So that's They've, so. are they purchasing, for instance, an owner-occupier in that instance to come back to New correct. Zealand? They have arrived, set up, job done. Mm -hmm. You would think it'd be easy. Good jobs, good income, good equity. Why can't they do that? Very good question. Yes, and so that leads to a very important question for any Kiwis who are overseas listening to this is how do you find a good mortgage broker on the ground in New Zealand in order to be able to help in order to help you transact and and get the lending you need over here in New Zealand because uh, obviously you can't use a mortgage broker who's who's based overseas. How do you, how do you do that? Well, look, it's just good old Google, isn't it? <laughs> you know, if you're um, buying in Christchurch, mortgage brokers in Christchurch. And luckily my name will come up reasonably high up. <laughs> <laughs> but that's all you do is just like anything else. It's Mr. Good Old Mr. Google. Um, getting a mortgage in New Zealand or in Christchurch, how is it done? You know, mortgage brokers in Christchurch. Uh, if you've obviously had your own relationship previously and still have a bank account with a bank, or you might have an old bank manager there as well. Obviously I'm going to recommend a mortgage broker myself, but just any way that you can get that advice and get the job done but it's a very common thing and the searches will get people like me or no I better not name other people but <laughs> you know what I mean. And actually just on that note so if you're overseas and you're wanting to take out a mortgage you have to meet AML requirements just talk to us about what those are and what that requires. Very difficult so a good example was the Hong Kong transaction we did <laughs> And it's just gone unconditional, and they ended up having to go into the New Zealand consulate. Is that the right word? Yeah. Have everything, you know, printed off the you know, you know birth certificate, driver's license, and passports, and certified by the whoever that person is. Yes. And then the originals, not photocopies, and not emails, or not, were posted. <laughs> no, seriously. By courier pigeon. Posted to New Zealand. So that they actually ended up at the bank as originals. So look, it is it's not easy. So 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 the message here is if you have a bank account with BNZ already set up, that is probably your best course to begin with. But you can still do that through a mortgage broker that deals with BNZ such as Tony. Having your bank account opens a big help. Yes, yes, because it's very hard. You have to actually be able to um, step into a branch pretty much nowadays to meet yeah. anti-money laundering requirements. Because it's just so hard when you're remote. And yes, yes, it can be done remotely, but it's really difficult. Very hard. And then similarly, if the message to anybody going overseas, if you were so inclined to go overseas at the moment, is don't close down your bank accounts. Correct. Leave them open so that you've still Correct. got that window to come back in Correct. if you want to. And if you do 
to take the risk and pop over to do a little bit of a trip and, and you know risk well not risk because you will be in lockdown for two weeks of course yeah. <laughs> and then risk it when you go back to wherever you are obviously open a bank account with a couple of banks while you're back in New Zealand so that those bank accounts are open for when you do buy. And so which banks are doing overseas uh, uh, lending at the moment? Is it is it all of them or is it some of them? No, 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 they all will do it. They all will do it as long as you meet the specific policy of the specific bank at that time. Uh, so no, no, they, they, all, they all have the transactional ability to do it. Um, in theory. In theory. <laughs> and Tony, one last question. Yes. Let's talk about uh, the people who aren't Kiwis. So say I'm a Canadian or I'm American and I want to purchase one of those apartments that we talked about that were that are exempt under the Overseas Investment Act. How are the banks treating those sorts of customers? Is it the exact same as Kiwis living it, overseas? It is when they've actually got the exemption because it's still that 30% deposit. So it is the same. And, and unfortunately, it's not like um, you know the exemptions for the new bills with the eighty percent. It's still the seventy, and it's still the sensitisation of the income. Actually, I, I would say that I can't think of any variance. Actually, no, I don't think no, there is. I don't think there is. So it's the same it is rules. What it is. It's the same rules, but they're tough rules. But they are. Look, they are tough. And and look, let's face it. Someone like me probably will be able to help navigate that rule because the rules are. You know, pretty tricky. <laughs> yes. Fantastic. Let's wrap it up there. But please don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. It really does help us get the message out to more people. And hey, if you want to learn more about property with Andrew and I, why not come along to our in-person Property Academy podcast live podcast recording. Now, remember, we are pushing these dates out by six weeks, and I will pop exactly what those dates are in the show notes. Uh, we are having to do that because of the move up in levels because of COVID, and we do want it to be safe when we all get together. We want to be up... Uh, mixing around, uh, cheersing each other and meeting each other and talking about property. So those will be pushed out. So Temple Swipe over the cover art. I'm going to drop a link in there or just go to opuspartners.co.nz slash pod event to see those new dates. Thanks for listening to the Property Academy podcast. I'm your host, Ian McKnight. And I'm Andrew Nichol. And we'll be back again tomorrow with even more daily strategies, tactics and insights to help you get the most out of the New Zealand property market. Until next time. <laughs> <laughs>